think about how to share the value of the market and with others, you'll bring long-term customers and loyalty, and you'll build a fantastic business for yourself. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the unique relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and our guest today is Jean-Manuel Isere, otherwise known as JMI from here on out. Here are three things you want to know about JMI before we start. He has been a consultant with BCG Boston Consulting Group for over 26 years. He is the co-author of the new book, Game Changer, and he loves to teach math So any kids 7 to 17 who visit his house in Tahoe have to do math. Uh, Welcome, Jean-Manuel. Thank you very much, Mark. So how did you get into pricing? Um, I got into pricing uh, with a very simple way. Uh, I started to work at Shell. And uh, after a couple of years, I ended up working on the pricing of service stations because the guy on the other side of uh, of the office was doing this and, uh, and I trying to help out. That's, that's one way. Uh, but more broadly, pretty quickly going out of shells, I knew I wanted to become a consultant. Um, and I also learned that I didn't want to work on costs. And so I did two things. One is I moved to, uh, Berkeley to follow my wife who was doing her MBA there. Uh, but working in Silicon Valley was uh, a way to be sure I would always work on growth and, and never on costs. And then within that, I chose to focus on pricing, which I had a little bit of experience and a starting uh, point with, you know, pricing the pure commodity that uh, gas is, gasoline, Uh, and then starting to learn how to price lots of other things like software and technology products and and many more. And then I never left. Nice. Okay. I wasn't expecting to ask you this, but since you worked at Shell, I have to ask this. Mm -hmm. Give me your explanation for why the price of gas at the pump goes up the day the price of oil goes up. And as the price of oil goes down, the price at the pump goes down slowly. Um, Well, it's the typical asymmetry of the uh, people who do pricing on gasoline know they don't have that much to play with. Uh, you could you could play with different elasticity in different stations, but it's quite complicated and so on. The obvious is you play with time. And over time, uh, as soon as you have a pretext to bring your prices up, and if you know your competitors will do exactly the same thing and push their prices up, you know, you know, customers will not have a choice. And it's not like people can decide to not drive their truck to work in the morning. They will have to, and no matter what, they will do that. And then on, on the other side is the asymmetry. You try to keep it as high as possible for as long as possible and to keep your margins up. And the fact that, again, you have at a local level, not that much competition. Usually, you know, you price with three or four stations around your station. Um, means that you could observe what they do and you could retaliate to stations that don't, um, you know, play well, let's say the, the game. And it's a very micro game that everybody plays. And, uh, that's what I observed that at the time. And, uh, you know, since you observe, observe the same facts that that's going on everywhere in the world. Yeah. So that's essentially the explanation I always give that when it goes up, uh, that price of oil going up is a signal to everybody to say, Hey, let's go raise prices. Yes. And, and then and, as it comes down, it's competitive pressures that are driving it down, but that's much more slow. That's right. And I think we could draw a parallel to what happened uh, at the end of COVID and the inflation time that we've been to. Um, maybe like me and many others, you have observed that often uh, companies have a tendency to overestimate elasticity. In other words, to think they will lose a lot of volume if they push the prices up 
more than what the reality is actually, uh, which means on average, many companies tend to price slightly under where the optimum is. But when COVID hit, we had two things hitting simultaneously. Uh, first, a you know microeconomic shock with less supply of many products and so on that pushed the prices up. But I think the price increase we got and so the inflation we got surprised many economists is because the price increase was more than just what the cost shock would have cost, would have driven. And it's because everybody realized they could push the prices up without worrying too much because their competitor was also pushing the price up. Um, and so that's sort of what we've seen uh, with a burst of inflation that surprised everybody in the first time in 20, 25 years, 30 years. is exactly the same effect that you highlighted for gas stations. Uh, very interesting. And so do you think that prices will actually come back down or do you think they're going to stay where they are and maybe go up at the 2% inflation rates we've always seen historically? Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll get back to the 2%, uh, 2.5% historical inflation rate that everybody is used to. Um, but I think the, the pattern is really dependent on the type, what we call the type of game in the book that, that an industry can find themselves. So it's not the same answer everywhere. Uh, so we've seen already that for what we call the cost game where you price cost plus or the dynamic game where you have a lot of fluctuations over time and so on, these prices have adapted and come back down. All prices have come back down until, of course, we have a war in, <laughs> in the Middle East and then suddenly they, they, they go back up. But, but all prices, food prices have come up and down for commoditized products. Uh, but on the other side, the price of watches and high-end pianos went up faster and that's it. They're <laughs> not going to go back down because they are priced to value uh, and they take a share of the value. Customers at the high end of the markets have actually quite a bit of willingness to pay and continues to continue to do well during the, uh, during the pandemic and after. And so therefore the pressure to bring these prices down is less. So we're going to, uh, for some markets, we go back to some prices, uh, down. And we've seen this already partially. Uh, you've seen it in supermarkets with a bunch of supermarket chains chain committed to, uh, to pulling the prices back down. Uh, but you have a lot of other markets. I just talked about luxury items, but you could think about subscriptions as well, Netflix and so on. I don't believe these prices are going to go down. Uh, and we can talk more details about why they are different games and therefore they have different behaviors. Yeah. Uh, okay. So since you brought up the word game and your title of your book is Game Changer, tell, first off, why'd you write the book and, uh, and give me a big overview on what it's about. So, um, I wrote the book because, um, over the years, I found that the largest impact of pricing changes was not about changing prices but was about changing price structures and pricing models. And I thought there was not enough written about pricing models. What you could find is a list of you know, books and, and articles taking, oh, look at this list of eight pricing models. And a new one would say, oh, there are actually 10 pricing models. And you can pay as you go and subscription and you know good, better, best, and all of that. And I wanted to try to bring some order uh, and, and a framework that allows people to make these pricing models choices, uh, in a better way. And to do that, I came back to the fundamentals of, of pricing, uh, which is you make every pricing decisions with cost, value, and what competitors are doing in mind. And then you have the intersections between sometimes you combine information, cost information and value informations. And, and that's what elasticity allows you to do. And sometimes you combine cost and competition and that's what game theory allows you to do. And sometimes you combine what value and uh, what competition tells you. And that's what behavioral science tells you to do. And if you combine everything is roughly the supply demand framework that, that we all know and love. So I just went with a simple starting with three different sources of information. They intersect with three different frameworks that we all use depending on the time. Uh, and in the middle is a supply demand framework. And that gives you seven positions. Uh, and maybe I should show it with, with my fingers, with just seven fingers. But that, that seven position of these Venn diagrams with three things intersecting, they actually correspond to different pricing methods. You could price just based on your costs. You could price just based on the elasticity. 
You can also price just based on elasticity. You could price just based on where your competitors are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can price, price based on a combination. And so uh, this combination of sources of info and methods about how to do pricing actually fit within this Venn diagram I described. And as I discovered over the last 15 years playing with, with this framework a little bit, it's uh, you actually have different market characteristics that drive you to price a different way. Uh, in other words, when can you price to value? Well, usually you tend to have a very differentiated product that there's not that many competitors. So you have one main competitor, a lot of customers, one very differentiated product. It's the opposite to when are you forced to price to cost? You're forced to price to cost if your product is not differentiated, if you have a lot of competitors that all do exactly the same thing, and you have a very super powerful buyers that buy a lot and will push you your prices down the cost. So it's the opposite to the, the, the what I call the value game. And so when you go around the Venn diagram, you find that you have different market characteristics, whether on the differentiation of your product, the concentrations of your buyers, and the concentration of the sellers that determine what game you play. And so the book is an exploration of all these games, uh, what characterizes them, uh, what is the best way to win in these games, and then also when is it relevant to think about how to change game from one to the other. Could people that are cost and competitors that are in the cost game, can they move to the value game? Is it possible for anybody to price to value? How do you move from one place to the other? So the entire book is about exploring these games as a general framework, simplifying the math into uh, what is the market like, and then helping people make simple decisions because you don't have to consider all the time every single type of framework economics that, that you could look at. Uh, and you can just be more focused on uh, in my industry today, this is the game I'm playing. This is how I will win. Okay, I have to say that I love that explanation. And by the way, I'm looking at the chart right now uh, while we're talking. And, yeah. and I love the explanation uh, because it forces me to think really hard. But I do want to push back. Mm -hmm. I personally always teach value-based pricing, always, mm -hmm. without exception. And, and I define value as charge what a customer is willing to pay. And so now when I, when I look through your chart and I say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm shell and I'm pricing gasoline, right? Obviously cost drives a lot of what's happening, but what's really driving that is my competitors' reactions. And so, so my customers get to choose between my product, my competitors' product, and so what are they willing to pay for my product? Well, if I'm on the right-hand side of the road, if I have a better brand name, they might pay three cents more than my competitors do. And so that, to me, is value-based pricing. Yes. So I'd love to hear your explanation of that. So um, you're right that it is helpful for everybody to think about the value they create and what their customers are willing to pay. Uh, it is also right that for everybody, and so why do we tend to emphasize value more often? Well, because every most of people, when you think about pricing, think about their costs. That's what Aristotle started to, you know, so, so the cost is a given. Everybody thinks about their cost. Uh, when they know a little bit of market, they think about their competitors and their, and they look at what they do and where they, what they could do and so on. So the most common item people look at is everybody looks at cost. Most people look at competition. And it's as an advisor for pricing, telling them, hey, think about the value that you create for your customers is always a good way to help them rethink. Uh, but what, how far you're going to be able to go with that value logic depends a little bit of your circumstances. So, uh, for instance, when Apple comes out with the iPod, the advice to the product manager of Apple to think about the value they create with the iPod is really fundamental and helps them refrain. If they just look at competition and all the MP3 players are priced around 100 bucks between 80 bucks 79 and 119. And Apple basically puts uh, a hard disk drive in it that allows you to have more songs. Uh, so 200 songs instead of 20. Um, 
if you don't think too much about the value and you know that the little hard disk drive costs you 40 bucks, you think, ah, you know, I could go between $100, which is the average price, plus 40, which is, you know, my margins are, are less, but I have the same, you know, in percentage, I have the same amount, or maximum 200 bucks, and that's where you think. And where does Apple come out? Apple comes at 500, 499, I think, the first, the first iPod, and around 400 bucks for a while. And, and not only do they come out at a much higher price point than anybody imagined, but they take over the market in three years. Illustration of your point, you think about the value creatively and suddenly you can, you know, unleash uh, a lot of productivity, a lot of value for you, your customers, you can gain the market and so on. Now the question is, could everybody do that? What, you know, what allowed Apple to do this in ways that other people could not necessarily do? Think about a startup coming out with, you know, new MP3 players with this idea of putting a hard disk drive in it. Well, uh, Steve Jobs went to the music industry and told them, you're going to stop bundling these albums all together and you're going to unbundle the whole thing. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're not going to have a business anyway because Napster is going to take over. Uh, so I'm going to help you, but you need to help me. And these are the conditions. He also told them, and by the way, the price of all your songs is going to go to a very simple 99 cents per song. And I don't want to hear people like there's songs that are better than the other, blah, 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 like make it simple. Right. Uh, and so not everybody could do that. And at the same time, he put $300 million of advertising at the launch that even Sony, who owned the music worker space by inventing the, uh, the, the cassette just 30 years late ago was not ready to spend. And so the condition for, uh, Apple to be successful with the iPod was to uh, align a number of things uh, in the ecosystem and to offer the entire experience as a solution, which was really hard for others to do. And so I think it is helpful for anybody in any market to think about the value that they create for customers and uh, and never thinking about it is usually a mistake. Now, how much you're going to be able to extract also depends on the unicity of your value proposition, uh, the level of competition you have, uh, the concentration of your customers. If you have just two customers, it's going to be very different than if you have millions of customers. And so that combination is something that leads you to the uh, other games. Um, and, and just to take the symmetric uh, perspective, uh, I would always advise people that are in, in the pure value game and think they're only, you know, value is the only thing to think about what is competition doing? It's always relevant for them. And thinking a little bit about game theory for people that are in the luxury items and selling perfumes and say, I do not care about competition because my product is so much better. Look at this magnificent advertising that I had. Well, just look at what they're doing. Maybe you could learn something and maybe you'll find uh, some inspirations about how they go to market and how they advertise or promo or what else. You have always something to learn from other sides of this Venn diagram I was talking about. Everywhere you are, think about what people on the other side are doing and is it relevant for you? How can you learn from that? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. First off, I agree 100%. Um, although I always teach value-based pricing, costs matter in some ways. Com competitors matter in some ways. So we always have to think about those things uh, mm -hmm. and we have to think about value. As you told the iPod story, I had a realization that I'd never had before, which I thought was kind of funny. So Steve Jobs prices the iPod based on value, mm -hmm. but he forces the music industry to not. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And he so he changes the game for the music industry and takes over, uh, but if you think about how value has been ex extracted from like the willingness to pay for consumers of music is roughly the same today as a proportion of their income as it was 50 years ago. But 50 years ago, uh, most of the value were extracting by some people that were music fans buying a lot of records. And, and that's where the spend was varying and the spend on the devices were pretty fixed. Uh, and we got to the other side, right? Um, and the value, a lot of the value has been extracted by the devices. 
Uh, think about how some headphones now are at 500 bucks a piece because they're so good and so on. Why are the headphones so expensive? Um, well, it's because the music is not expensive. And you have the same willingness to pay overall for the music experience. At least that's my interpretation. Uh, and we, we have seen also that in the, in the music industry, you have, uh, in music production industry, essentially, a lot more money went into concerts and live performances uh, than was the case in the 80s and 90s. Uh, because people have adapted to the ecosystem changing, and uh, but the willingness to pay the average spend per consumer and for the fans is roughly the same at percentage of your income uh, as it was uh, 30 years ago. It's just shifted where the spend was. Yeah, I think that's pretty interesting. Where does and and some people who love music have a certain size of their budget they're willing to spend. So where mm -hmm. are we going to spend it on? Yes, and, that's right. And if it's not on buying albums and going to concerts, it's headsets. Yeah. It also used to be really expensive speakers. Yes, that's right. And then and then suddenly it was hard to connect the speakers to uh, to to the internet. And then for a while, the the, the speaker market went down in terms of margin and so on. So yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, nice. Um, I have so many things or so many directions I could take this. Let me ask you about elasticity, mm -hmm. which is one of my least favorite topics. And it's really interesting the way you have it in your chart. Uh, you identify exactly why it's my least favorite topic, and that is that it ignores competition. Mm -hmm. And so if someone uses elasticity and says, oh, look, it's highly elastic, um, I should lower my price so I can gain more share, well, what's the competitor going to do? And we just ignored that. So I tend to tell people not to do elasticity, but I would love to hear your, your thoughts about that. Okay. Um, I also first discovered myself that elasticity was very often completely irrelevant and I can tell some more stories, but, but just to, to build a little bit on people tend to overestimate the importance of elasticity and for most market is not as important. So let me talk about when is it important? When can you ignore what competition is doing? Well, if you have a market with, let's say 20 competitors, all with roughly the same product, but not exactly the same product. Can you and and you price into you know a lot of different stores everywhere around the country and so on? Can you track where the prices of every single one of your competitors on every single product? It's really impossible. And on average, the competitors are going to roughly if you have if you are in a mature market, the, the the prices have roughly converged and they're roughly in the same place. So they're slightly above, slightly lower. But, but they don't, you know, the average of what customers are willing to pay is roughly the same. At that point, uh, elasticity could be relevant for you. You are small. So if you are a small player in this very fragmented market, that's the only place when I think elasticity can matter because the competitors don't react to you because you're really small. Like you are one twentieth of the markets, like nobody sees you and so on. And the same way you don't see them, they don't see you and everybody prices roughly. And so the way to get feedback about the market is, well, each person, each competitor moves their prices a little bit up and down. They observe their volume and their resulting margins going up and down and they optimize to that. That's that situation. As soon as you have um, less competitors, suddenly you could start to track what they do. As soon as you have one, two, three competitors that are much bigger than others, have more influence on the market, then everybody looks at them. You can't afford to not look at them. And therefore, elasticity becomes irrelevant because you need to take into account the game theory aspect of things that you just mentioned when you look at, uh, at what competitors is doing. And by the way, value also matters. And if instead of just saying, oh, this is where my product is and I'm just going to move my price, if you think about, well... What do my customers want? Can I change my product to get something that my customers might want more? Can I differentiate myself? Can I can, can I go in, in, in niches and so on? Suddenly, when you're in a niche, your niche is closer to be yours, to be you're more important. You have more concentration of your less competitors. And suddenly, elasticity, again, doesn't matter anymore. So, uh, and then if you were to be in a, in a market where you're in the B2B space, and you give different prices to di to every single customer, then suddenly elasticity doesn't matter because what matters is 
the willingness to pay and the value equation of every single customer. And the aggregate where everybody pays the same price is not relevant anymore. So you have so many market situations that make it such that elasticity doesn't matter as much. But there is, you know, with the right combination of market structure, competition, and so on, I think in that particular place, it matters and it's helpful to know the concepts and to be able to play with it. Okay, I think that's a very fair answer. I've always... I've always realized that elasticity was good for industries, right? Economists use it for industries all the time, and it makes sense. And so if you essentially have a monopoly, elasticity makes sense for you. Um, so if there's, if you have no competitors, but the thing you just taught me, which I'm thrilled that I learned something new is that if you are a tiny, tiny fish in a big pond, it's no one's going to respond to you. So it doesn't matter. You can use elasticity. That's right. Um, that's right. And, and that's, yeah. that's a, another use case that, that I find valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what's your favorite of the games? Uh, my favorite is a choice game. You want okay, to offer that? choices. So the choice game is the game that is at the intersection of competition and value. It's one that says costs don't matter anymore. So uh, if you look at the how the economy has evolved, a lot of the innovation over the past 20 years has happened in markets where the marginal costs are either small or negligible, and therefore they don't matter. When you're in that space and you still have significant competition, you, so you can't afford to price to value and not worry about competition, um, you, you need to think about how to frame the choices for your customers. Um, and you have a lot of ways to do that. It requires deep understanding of the customers, segmenting them really well, finding the right things, letting your customers self-select to where you're going to price. You can't price based on cost because the costs are not there anymore. Uh, and if you, and if you get you, so an example of that industry is a software industry. And if in the software industry that has so many upfront costs, you start to, uh, have a product that is different for every single customer. Uh, then the development costs and the maintenance costs get so much in fixed costs that you can't have a business anymore. And so, for instance, the software industry needed to price uh, with a choice game, but it's not the only industry that does not think about, you know, Starbucks. When you walk into a Starbucks uh, store, uh, you will have a choices between coffees. If one of them, if the extra latte with pumpkin spice thing and so on, you think it's too expensive, you can get something more, something less expensive, but it will still be in Starbucks. You won't walk out. You came in with friends. You have choices. And, and I think the behavioral science is the art of framing choices for customers is varied, complicated, interesting, all terms of all types of situations that have different answers. Uh, and that's both, uh, fun and can create a lot of value for uh for people who play that well and that's therefore my, my preferred game nice um i often think software companies or data companies have this huge advantage that they don't have hard costs because then they have no choice they have to price on value otherwise right. they'd be pricing at zero yes you're exactly right uh, but that's also, that's not true only for these, you know, data services or software industries is mostly true for the healthcare industry when it comes to, uh, pharmaceutical products, drugs, the, the cost of producing drugs is, you know, minimal, uh, when you bring it in comparison to the cost of developing the drugs. Yeah. JMA, we are going to, JMI, we are going to have to wrap this up. Uh, but I'm going to ask the final question I always ask. What is one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? That we haven't talked about before. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it simple. Um, price. When people think about pricing, they tend to think about prices. They tend to think about the number. If you want to reframe the conversations about how you can uh, gain more traction in the market. Uh, think about your pricing model. Think about the unit by which you price. 
Think about the way you package the choices for your customers. Think about uh, things that come before you come to the price. Reframe the conversation. Don't go right to what's the number. Goes to how do we think about how we exchange value with our customers. And, uh, and the results of if you do that, you'll spend more time thinking about how should you share value? How much value does it deserve? As opposed to extracting the value which is a word I, I hate about. I love the word value. I, I hate the word extracting. Think about how to share the value of the market and with others. You'll bring long-term customers and loyalty and you'll build a fantastic business for yourself. Nice. Thank you so much. And by the way, I agree completely. Uh, the, the number itself is not as important as the structure. Oh my gosh. So um, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Um, I'm pretty accessible on LinkedIn, uh, but if you want to send me an email, uh, it's pretty simple. Email at jmi at bcg.com. That has to be the shortest email address I've ever heard. <laughs> My <laughs> nice. And to our listeners, thank you for your time today. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing, feel free to email me, Mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.